Amen. That is a good old Church of Christ song. Amen. They sang it just like I taught them. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to be opening to John chapter 20. There's a Bible in the pew rack in front of you, or you can pull out your device and, and go to John chapter 20. Uh, if you were, some of you were here last week. If you are here last week, uh, I wore a suit and a tie. Uh, got more comments about my tie last week than I've received in a long, long time. Uh, so as you would suspect, when I got here this morning, I had some folks ask me, well, why aren't you wearing a tie on Easter Sunday? And I said, look, if a guy gets up out of the grave, how am I supposed to keep my tie on, right? For those of you who wore ties this morning, God bless you. I believe God is given me a message today that I pray will be an encouragement and a blessing to you. Let's pray. So Father, as we open your word, Father, I pray that you will do that, which I'm unable to manufacture. That you will take these words, make them your very own. God, that you will do that work of transformation in our hearts and minds that that only you can do, that can only be achieved by the, the Holy Spirit. Father, I pray that just uh, right now that we'll, we'll limit distractions as best we can, that we will uh, just pray for some folks that are sitting around us or some folks that are joining us online right now. Just, just pause and just, just pray for them. Some of them we know and some of them we may not know. God, we pray that each of us will have ears to hear your word. We know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's in Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. On June 19th, 1899, uh, while writing an editorial for the newspaper, uh, Louis Klops, I just noticed these words from Luke 22 and verse 30. This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And impressed by the symbolism that he saw on the, the page, he approached one of his trusted publishing colleagues and just asked, could, could Jesus' words, could, could Christ's words be printed in, in red? Now, this was 1899, so you know, the, the advances in technology weren't exactly there yet. But his colleague replied, he said, it could do no harm, and it most certainly could do much good. So an initial red-letter version of the Bible was printed in some 60,000 copies of the King James Version, and it quickly sold out. Uh, President uh, Theodore Roosevelt was so encouraged by the red-letter Bible that he invited Louis Klops to dinner and ever since, uh, red letter Bibles have been a fixture in our Bible translations, whichever translation that you find yourself with this morning. Uh, we've said for several weeks now that uh, we believe that all Scripture is God breathed. Uh, we, we, we read that in 2 Timothy 3.16, that it's God breathed, it's useful for teaching and, and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness. And, and as we pay attention to the words of Jesus, the very word that became flesh and dwelt among us, his words begin to give shape and form and texture to our often weary lives, come what may. So today we consider the, the red letters of the resurrected Jesus. Three questions and three powerful statements. If you'll follow along with me in John chapter 20, starting in verse 1. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. I've found it interesting now for the past four or five years that 
uh, the, the first person uh, to this building on Easter Sunday is one of our tech arts guys, John, John Beddingfield. Uh, scripture says that John was the first one uh, to, to the tomb. And, and I'm thankful for, for John's dedication. Verse 5, he bent over, looked in at the strips of linen lining there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and, and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Verse 8, finally the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. Verse 9, they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Verse 10, then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look in the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said. And I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Jesus walks out of the grave, and one of the first questions that he asks is, who are you looking for? Who is it that you are looking for? We have a, a great tendency in this life to to determine for ourselves uh, what we are looking for. Uh, we, we, we determine what we are looking for before discovering who we are looking for. So I, I'm looking for more money. I, I'm looking for a bigger house. I'm looking for companionship. I am looking for happiness. I'm looking for physical intimacy. I'm, I'm looking for a better status. I'm looking for peace. I'm looking for rest. I'm looking for control. I'm looking for. And the question is not what. The, the question is who. Who is it that you are looking for? Continuing in verse 15. Thinking he was the gardener, she says, Sir, if, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him, cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. It wasn't uh, until Jesus called her by name that she recognized the who, that she recognized who she was looking for. It's a reminder for all of us that until we define our who, your what will lack true meaning. Question number two and question number three come in the same passage. We turn over to Dr. Luke's account in Luke chapter 24 and verse 38. Jesus in his resurrected state, these are the resurrected words of Jesus, as he, as he stands before his disciples, he said to them, why are you troubled? Why do doubts rise in your minds? It's questions two and three. Why are you troubled? Why do, do doubts rise in your minds? The disciples have absolutely had their minds blown. Have you ever had your mind blown by something? I don't care how intellectual you think you are, there's times in life where your, your mind just gets blown. Uh, first time that I, I held our, our firstborn child in my arms, mind blown. I mean, I didn't have a shelf to put that on, right? There's times in life where our, our minds, the disciples' minds are, are just blown. And earlier in Luke 24, a guy named Cleopas and an unnamed disciple are walking on the road to Emmaus. It's about a seven-mile walk from Jerusalem. Jesus shows up. He shows up, but they don't know that it's Jesus. They don't know that it's Jesus walking beside them. And he asks them, what are they talking about? And they, they just reply, we're talking about Jesus. 
and, and they said we had, we had hoped, we, 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 we were hoping that, that he was going to redeem Israel. We were, we were hoping that he was going to, to redeem Israel. But they crucified him. And some of the women said that he was alive, but our, our companions, they, they went to check it out, and there was no Jesus. So in Luke 24 and verse 25, we read this. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Jesus has a a seven-mile Bible study, and the Bible says these disciples' hearts were burning. Why? Because Jesus rewires their interpretation of death. On June, or July rather, 28th, 2013, there was a, a sermon that was preached from this pulpit, and it wasn't from me. I was the preaching minister at that time, but it was a sermon from a friend of mine whose name was Josh Patrick. And unlike me sometimes, it only takes Josh about 60 seconds to get to the point. Take a moment, turn your attention to the screen. Good morning, Homewood Church. I am stoked to be here with you to preach Jesus. I'm a little unnerved when I go somewhere and preach to people I don't know. I don't like to be the disembodied talking head that comes in and cuts and pastes from a sermon I preached in Franklin, Tennessee, assuming that what God is doing there is exactly what God is doing here. So I'm honestly a bit anxious. I hope that the Lord will use my broken life and the questions I have and the battles I have fought and just the mess that is me. Uh, I I hope that you don't get the impression that I have everything figured out. I don't. Uh, I have more questions than answers. I have gone through uh, lots of painful experiences, and I know that I'm not a unique and special snowflake in that regard. We've all had some tough stuff to walk through, but I am convinced, utterly convinced, that Jesus Christ is the hope of the world. And the main reason I believe this is because God, through the life and the indwelling life of Christ in me, uh, he's raised me from the dead. Uh, so the first question that some of you who are new to Homewood may have is, um, wait a minute, y'all, y'all used to have a catwalk right here? In the... <laughs> yeah, Brother Wayne remembers that catwalk, right? Uh, and I'm thankful, you know, there was actually a, a huge rock that this church was built on uh, right here. Um, and that's good theology, but it makes for a poorer stage. And, and so uh, that, that auditorium, this was refurbished about a decade ago. Uh, but that's not the reason that I showed you that video. Uh, the reason that I, I showed you that video is because 18 months after Josh preached that sermon here, he was diagnosed with colon cancer. And on January 13th, 2019, Josh stepped into eternity at the age of 39. Uh, You'll see on the screen one of the pictures of Josh's family. Alongside his wife, Joni, and their three daughters. Uh, Josh grew up in Huntsville, Alabama. uh, Met his uh, sweet wife, Joni, as they were freshmen at Lipscomb University. And they began uh, building a life together. And you can tell three precious daughters who loved him dearly. Uh, Recently, his wife, Joni, published a book of Josh's sermon series called Living Hope. It's a sermon series on the book of 1 Peter. And the guiding text for Josh in the sermon series is is 1 Peter 1, verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. 
This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold which perishes even though refined by fire may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Josh says these compelling words in the book. If Jesus is alive, then he demands and deserves our absolute allegiance. If he's alive, we should stop what we're doing and fall to our knees to acknowledge his unsurpassed brilliance, unrivaled power, and unchallenged authority, then rearrange our entire lives here, now, pronto. I love that quote from Josh. I've never heard anyone speak more plainly than Josh Patrick about our living hope. Great Britain's prime minister during World War II was a man named Winston Churchill. What you may not know is that Churchill planned his own funeral. You'll see a picture of it on the screen. And he did so with the hope that Resurrection and and eternal life were were not just good ideas, but that he actually believed them to be true. He instructed after the benediction that a bugler be positioned high in the dome of St. Paul's Cathedral and play taps, the universal signal that the day is over. Taps. It sounds the notes of death, and those notes can be sobering and melancholy. But Churchill planned that the last notes to be sounded would not be the taps. Rather, at a moment that came this very dramatic transition, as Churchill had instructed, another bugler was placed on the other side of the massive dome as he played the notes of Reveille, the universal signal that a new day has dawned and it's time to rise. That was Churchill's testimony that at the end of history, the last note will not be taps. It'll be Reveille. The Reveille swallows up the sounds of taps and declares for all to hear that God has promised a new heavens and a new earth. That the taps signaling the death of the day will not be the last sound. And heaven is that kind of promise because of the resurrection. Uh, This summer, I'm uh, preparing, Lord willing, a a series on heaven. And uh, you're not going to want to miss this summer series that we're going to be doing. Three questions of the resurrected Jesus. Who is it that you're looking for? Why are you troubled? Why do doubts rise in your minds? Followed by three amazing statements of hope from the resurrected Jesus. Let's keep going in John 20, verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, here's the red letters. Here's the first statement. Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. The first takeaway this morning is that through resurrection, Jesus' death certificate became our birth certificate. The reality is that Jesus was sending his disciples into a life that would seemingly resemble anything but a life of peace. His disciples would continue to encounter persecution. His disciples would continue to encounter trials and tribulations. His, his disciples would continue to encounter the realities of grief and death. C.S. Lewis, uh, arguably one of the greatest theologians of the 20th century, died in 1963. He, he married his wife, Joy, in 1956. 
she died four years later of cancer. Lewis opened his pained heart to the world in a little book called A Grief Observed. And he says in the book, this is how he begins, no one ever told me that grief felt so like fear. I'm not afraid, but the sensation is like being afraid. The same fluttering in the stomach, the same restlessness, the yawning. I keep on swallowing. And then some of the most uncomforting words ever from the pen of a man whose words have comforted so many. It's not on the screen, but here's what Lewis said. Talk to me about the truth of religion and I'll listen gladly. Talk to me about the duty of religion, and I'll listen submissively. But don't come talking to me about the consolations of religion, or I shall suspect you don't understand. Hmm. But somewhere on Lewis's journey, the, the fog began to lift. He began to sense that doors to life were beginning to open. That the, the pain that was there and, and he would hobble the rest of his life because of the grief he had experienced. And Lewis said, I'm, I'm learning to get about on crutches, but I shall never be a human again. Many of you in this room understand the fog of grief. You understand the, the fog of despair. You've walked through the, the fog of disappointment. And I have no doubt that the fog of life continued to be present itself in the disciples' lives. And the question becomes, can we find our way through the fog? Friday night, we had about 77 prayer cards turned in. I prayed over each one of them yesterday. And there was a common theme throughout all the cards. I, I won't mention any specifics, but it wasn't said in these words, but it was certainly said in, in this vein, and, and that was, Lord, help me find my way through the fog. Jesus emerges through the fog of Good Friday, burning off the mist of the fog and the blazing heat of his resurrection, declaring aloud that the fog we discover the one who makes the sun visible again. We can hear Reveille in a world full of taps. Second statement we see is in verse 22. And with that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Romans chapter 8 and 11 says this, that and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because his spirit who lives in you. Takeaway number two is that the spirit of the resurrection is the spirit in you. Jesus told his disciples that he would not leave them alone, nor does he leave us alone. So we pray, come Holy Spirit. Verse 24, now Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where his nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my sides, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Verse 28, Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus told him. Here's the third statement. Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. The final takeaway is that the resurrected Jesus declares you blessed. Not for seeing. 
for believing. Three powerful statements, three game-changing realities for you and for me as we prepare for our time of communion this morning. I want to invite you to pull out your communion packet and take a moment if you are able to just observe the little piece of bread. Observe the the cup. What we're about to do is, is one of the most fundamental, critical practices of our faith. According to 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, communion is a proclamation of the gospel. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Those words, until he comes, are built on the resurrection and ascension of our Lord and Savior. We partake in the Lord's Supper this morning. We are proclaiming the certainty of our own resurrection until Jesus returns and fulfills his promise. Will you pray with me? Father, we give thanks for the bread, which represents Christ's body. We proclaim his death, his burial, his resurrection and his ascension until he returns. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. The body of Christ given for you. Let's pray for the cup. So, Father, we give thanks for the cup, which represents the blood of your Son. We proclaim his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension until he returns. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The blood of Christ given for you.
So haven't I learned that my ways are as high as yours are? You alone keep the universe from crumbling into dust. You are God. Church, aren't you thankful that he's not in a, in a tomb, but he is there. If I don't preach the gospel to myself every day, I find myself trying to trust in my ability, to trust in my own experience, to trust in myself. So in the infinite wisdom of Jesus, he instituted what we just participated in, this time of remembrance. We don't want to leave here today without giving you an opportunity to, uh, to spend a moment with one of our shepherds. Uh, there'll be one down front. There'll also be a, a shepherd back here in this room to my right. We're going to sing a couple more songs. And as we do, whatever, whatever that thing is, maybe... Maybe it's just something that has, you've been focusing on and, and has been, been distracting your attention from, from spending time with Jesus. The shepherds of this flock would, just, would love to just spend a moment praying with you about that. Maybe it's something that you're celebrating that they would, they would love to just come alongside you and celebrate with you. If today's the day that you want to name Jesus as Lord, and this, this is really where it comes, this is, this is why we gather each week, is, is to, to celebrate Jesus and to invite others into that story. And, and if today's the day that you want to be invited into that story in a real way, uh, we would encourage you to come, uh, to be baptized into Christ, to have your sins washed away and, and, and removed through, through repentance and baptism. And, and we, we know that Jesus is the one who does all that. He's the one that, that we place our trust in. He's the one that we place our faith in. So he's the one that we exalt today. Uh, so if you have a need, uh, we want to invite you at this time uh, to come as we stand and sing.